So thank you very much, David and Robert, for the kind invitation uh, to be here. I'm going to talk about regenerative medicine, specifically from the perspective of uh, cardiovascular disease. And within that, uh, I'll be specifically leading you to stem cell-derived cardiac muscle, both as a therapeutic product for uh, cell grafting, uh, but also importantly as an improved platform uh, for human cardiac drug discovery. Now, the conceptual underpinnings for this are the prevalence and irreversibility of ischemic uh, damage in acute myocardial infarction, and indeed the contribution of chronic, sporadic, indolent, ongoing cell death to uh, chronic cardiomyopathies and heart failure states. And by contrast to some of the uh, privileged uh, uh, model organisms, such as the zebrafish, which has been the recent poster child for the BHF in its Mending Broken Hearts campaign, uh, in which amputation of the tip of the heart uh, is followed by complete restitution of histologically normal myocardium over the course of just four weeks. Uh, this capacity does not exist uh, in our adult patients or the, uh, the members of this forum. Uh, interestingly, in newborn mice, this identical capacity exists. And here's a recapitulation of the zebrafish experiment. But this capacity in the newborn mouse is lost within one week of birth. And whether that's because of developmental changes in uh, the growth promoting and growth suppressing genes uh, is, uh, is not completely known, but that's likely to be a large part of it. Uh, we did uh, combined knockouts of the tumor suppressor RB plus its paralog P1, uh, G, uh, P130 in the heart a number of years ago. And that increases cardiac muscle cell proliferation more than 500-fold. Uh, others have taken developmental changes in the microRNAs uh, in the heart at one day versus one week and have pursued this as a potentially fruitful route to restart the proliferative capacity of the heart. Uh, be that as it may, at current, uh, the turnover in uh, human cardiac muscle is less than 1% a year when one's 20 uh, and less than 4 tenths of a percent uh, out in one's 60s and 70s. So the unmet need from a clinical perspective is reducing heart failure after heart attacks. Current treatments, including angioplasty stents and clot-busting drugs, uh, merely restore blood flow to the heart, uh, but none of these singly or collectively directly benefits the endangered or jeopardized cardiomyocyte. And again, from a clinical perspective, the importance of this is that each 5% increase in infarct size confers a 20% increased risk of heart failure or all-cause mortality at a year. So there's an unmet need for adjuncts to standard reperfusion therapy to rescue cardiac muscle cell number. From a 30,000-foot perspective, uh, there are four overarching strategies to increase heart muscle cell number. Uh, summarized in this review of ours in Genes in Development a couple of years ago. And we'll, to we'll touch on most, but not all of these uh, this afternoon. Uh, first, I want to mention uh, stem cell grafting using non-cardiac stem cells taken from bone marrow. Cell therapy for heart repair might sound futuristic or, or far off, but in fact, there have been more than 70 trials of bone marrow uh, for cardiac repair, uh, encompassing more than a thousand patients over the past 10 years. And the bottom line of these is that it is safe. Uh, there is, in many minds, a measurable benefit, although it's small, on the surrogate endpoint of left ventricular ejection fraction. There are no agreed outcome trials yet, but there's a large one going on in Europe currently. True regeneration, as some peppy enthusiasts thought 10 years ago, is doubtful. In other words, bone marrow does not transdifferentiate into cardiac muscle when injected into the cardiac milieu. And so the benefit for those benefits that are seen, the mechanism is more likely to be the known contribution of bone marrow to angiogenesis and a variety of paracrine effects on myocyte survival, function, potentially dormant stem cells in the adult heart, 
inflammation or remodeling. But as a further cautionary note, I would choose to emphasize that indeed there is no net benefit uh, in the most rigorous meta-analyses of this phenomenon uh, that have been explored uh, to date. Consequently, there is a need to find better routes to heart repair. Now, one of those, of course, is to inject or implant uh, cardiac myocytes from exogenous stem or progenitor cells with better proven ability uh, to enter the cardiac lineage. And those would include bona fide, multipotent, totipotent stem cells, uh, whether embryonic stem cells uh, or their adult equivalent, the so-called induced pluripotent stem cell. And in addition, there has been uh, much interesting work directly converting fibroblasts into cardiac muscle using a variety of cardiac transcription factors. And the next few slides will summarize that body of work. Uh, for those who might need reminding, embryonic stem cells are derived from very, very early embryos uh, at the blastocyst stage when the embryo is just a hollow ball of roughly 100 cells. And this asymmetric portion here, the inner cell mass, is what gives rise to the future embryo. When put in culture, these pluripotent cells from the blastocyst spontaneously give rise to nerve cells, cardiac muscle, or blood cells. And indeed, one starting cell can give rise to all the cell varieties in the body, something investigators take for granted in the lab uh, every time we make a uh, genetically engineered mouse, starting with an engineered embryonic stem cell. Now, for a variety of reasons, one is attracted to uh, induced pluripotent cells as an alternative. These are normal adult cells, most typically from the skin or blood, converting it into something that's embryonic stem cell-like, typically using a cocktail of two to four so-called stemness genes that are responsible for the pluripotency and growth potential of the <coughs> embryonic stem cell. And these have essentially identical plasticity, giving rise to cell types in the same way that ES cells do. So what are their advantages? Well, one is that they uh, overcome the <coughs> religious or ethical objections that some have to embryonic uh, stem cells as destroying human life. Uh, a second is that they are autologous uh, and confer less or no rejection and overcome the immunological barriers to, uh, to cell implantation from uh, allogeneic uh, exogenous sources. The third, at least in the case of uh, defined mutations, is the ability to generate patient-specific uh, models of disease. And the key feature that embryonic stem cells and pluripotent stem cells have is that they follow uh, in tissue culture the precise sequence of developmental steps that transpire in the native embryo from the time of the blastocyst to induction of the very primitive mesoderm, the germ layer that gives rise to the heart, uh, hematopoietic system, uh, bone, skeletal muscle, uh, cartilage, uh, and indeed in these transitions, the pluripotent stem cell responds to positive acting growth factors, negative acting growth factors, and growth factor antagonists that are expressed in the right time and the right place uh, in the native embryo to be regulators of this process during normal cardiac organogenesis, uh, as revealed through extensive knockout experiments and grafting experiments over the years. And so these typically involve the use of uh, growth factors from the TGF beta superfamily, including bone morphogenetic proteins and activin A as a surrogate for nodal, followed by the addition of an inhibitory inhibitor of Wnt signaling, such as uh, DICOP for other agents. Now, resulting from this, one can see here the homogeneity of cardiac myocytes that can be uh, obtained here by immunostaining for six heart-specific proteins. And importantly, these cells are functionally competent, uh, as shown by uh, uh, this video of em human embryonic stem cell-derived myocytes uh, made in my lab and containing a fluorescent marker of conversion to the cardiac phenotype. 
or as shown on the right, for induced pluripotent stem cells in uh, 3D engineered human heart tissue, uh, again, made by one of our PhD uh, students. So one doesn't have to have much imagination to see constructs like this or like this and think that they might have potential uh, in the heart repair by restoring uh, sarcomeres and beating myocytes to uh, an otherwise debilitated organ. Now, by exactly the same procedure, the exactly the same logic as the creation of induced pluripotent cells, for which Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize just a few years ago, uh, other investigators have taken the perspective of using transcription factors that mediate normal heart development and forcibly expressing these in fibroblastic cells, non-myocytes, uh, or the cardiac stroma to drive heart formation through exogenous transcription factors. I mean, pioneering experiment for this was done uh, in zebrafish, uh, forcibly expressing the transcription, GATA, transcription factor GATA5 in a non-heart forming region of the embryo. You can see here the normal expression of the cardiac myosin light chain, also seen here, but an additional region of cardiac muscle uh, formation uh, is shown by this technique here. This procedure has been expanded into the mouse and even into uh, human cells with cocktails that typically involve GATA factors, MEF2 factors, TBX5, uh, and uh, a number of others. And the ability to induce uh, multiple cardiac markers by this approach is shown here. Uh, and such cells, as I, as I emphasize, are functionally competent and even have been produced by gene delivery uh, in vivo. Strategies similar to this also have been taken, as mentioned, to manipulate the cardiac cell cycle. Now, the approach that dominated the work in my lab for a number of years was the search for dormant uh, adult cardiac stem cells in adult mammalian myocardium. Uh, and the list of markers that labs have used for analogous experiments uh, is shown here. We focused on the orphan receptor, stem cell antigen 1, uh, whose ligand is not known, but whose function in hematopoietic stem cell biology and mesenchymal stem cell biology is strongly asserted by the SCA1 knockout in mice. Others have used the hematopoietic growth factor receptor C kit, uh, the so called side population dye efflux assay, which tags the cells in bone marrow with the greatest plasticity and long term self renewal potential, <coughs> residual expression of developmental cardiac transcription factors, green thumb tissue culture techniques like the cardiosphere or colony forming unit assay. Uh, or expression of aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is also uh, interestingly used as a criterion for bone marrow stem cell purification. Now, having shown you that pluripotent cells like ES cells and IPS cells give rise to beating cardiac myocytes, why might one look anywhere else? Well, the reason is that besides the potential use of uh, cardiac progenitor cells as a cell therapy product. Uh, these are of academic interest and translational interest uh, because of their potential contribution, even unassisted to self repair, but more importantly, because these cells are in the heart already and are a potential target for activation in situ if we understood uh, the, uh, the, the ligands and pathways uh, that drive their function. Now, through a combination of uh, magnetic immunopurification, which we heard about in the immediately preceding talk, plus extensive uh, uh, flow purification with a variety of markers, uh, we've dissected the cardiac stroma into a number of subpopulations and have mapped the highly clonogenic population in the adult mammalian heart uh, to this set right here that co-express stem cell antigen 1, PDGF receptor alpha, and the side population dye efflux phenotype. And I mentioned that assay before. It's a dye exclusion assay devised by my Taylor colleague, Peggy Goodell, uh, when she was a postdoc at Harvard. 
Uh, most of the cells lie on the diagonal. The cells that expel the dye are shifted to the left, hence the, their name is the side population. Uh, and by the combination of the side population phenotype, PDGF receptor alpha expression, uh, and the reciprocal lack of uh, CD31, we defined a population of cells with a remarkably homogeneous signature enriched for the cardiac transcription factors I alluded to before, GATA factors, hand factors, T-box factors, as well as PDGF receptor, uh, the, the, the cognate marker of these, uh, of these cells. The cloning efficiency for these cells in our hands is a remarkable 30%. In a single cell deposition experiment, 30% give rise uh, to ro robust clones uh, at just uh, two weeks without a feeder layer or exhaustive manipulations. And those cells are truly multipotent. Uh, when injected into the hearts of injured mice, they give rise to cardiac muscle, they give rise to smooth muscle, they give rise to endothelium. Uh, and here is a typical uh, adult, mature, rod-shaped, striated cardiomyocyte co-expressing sarcomeric alpha-actin uh, and the uh, lentivirally delivered M-orange with the merged image here, isolated from a grafted heart at eight weeks. So far, so good. But we only found 10 cells like this, in fact, 10 donor-derived cells at all, at these late time points after grafting. Despite that, we saw pre prevention from heart failure uh, in the treated animals. So here is uh, mouse magnetic resonance imaging uh, by our uh, former postdoc, Dan Stuckey, who's uh, very happy now here at UCL. Uh, and here, Dan shows the marked expansion of the left ventricular cavity in end diastole, along with marked wall thinning, and in other images, the huge infarct by late gadolinium enhancement. And in the cardiac stem cell treated mice, we saw protection of the LV cavity dimensions, protection against wall thinning, reduction of infarct size, uh, and, and indeed prevention of heart failure. Well, if only 10 cells out of the 500,000 we delivered persist at 12 weeks, durable long-term engraftment is unlikely to explain the large benefits observed. And this limitation is not a peculiarity of the cells from our lab that I'm telling you about. This limitation is also true of virtually all other cells injected in the heart, including human cells similar to ours that are in seven clinical trials around the world for acute infarction, for established heart failure, and even for congenital disorders like single ventricle and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So one needs to look beyond what the cells become to explain the phenotypic benefits, and that requires looking, perhaps, at what the cells uh, secrete. So that brings me to the last general approach to heart repair, which is blocking cell death, either by inhibiting apoptosis, necrosis, and autophagy in some combination, or by providing supplemental cell survival signals. And indeed, the latter is part of the mechanism through which our cardiac stem cells benefit the heart. And so in a series of transwell assays in which human-induced pluripotent cell-derived cardiomyocytes are seeded, uh, and secretor cells, either the cardiac stem cells or other cell types, are in the transwell chamber, conditioning the medium that the cardiomyocytes see, we are able to see nearly complete protection of the human stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes by mouse cardiac stem cells acting in trans. Fibroblasts don't do that. Uh, other cells from the cardiac stroma uh, don't do that. Uh, and we've recapitulated these findings using just conditioned medium rather than a transwell experiment and are currently embarking on a proteomic uh, and, uh, and functional genomic screen to identify the exact protective factors that confer this benefit. Now, another way to approach the problem of cardiac muscle survival is not from the outside of the cell, in terms of signals the cell receives, 
but from inside the cell in terms of signal transduction cascades that are activated by cell stress and contribute to cell death. And this indeed has been a large focus of my work over the years. Typically these experiments entail biochemical and omic studies of diseased human heart tissue, uh, what Marty Rath would call elevator science. When you measure stuff, it goes up, goes down, or stays the same. Mimicking those changes in cardiac muscle cells through gain and loss of function mutations, and then moving the most salutary mutations into model organisms. Uh, and through this route, we identified nearly half a dozen novel pathways for cardiac muscle cell death over the years. Uh, three of them are shown here involving cyclin-dependent kinase 9, uh, telomere capping, and the uh, telomere repeat factor 2, uh, and TGF-beta activated kinase, or, or TAC1. And it was to pursue studies of this kind that I was motivated to move uh, to Imperial some years ago because of the climate for academic drug discovery uh, in the UK. And this work has come to focus on an upstream activator of TAC1 known as mitogen activated protein kinase, 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 kinase 4, or MAP4K4. It's a member of the STE20 branch of the human kinome, and it's shown here along with its uh, closest relatives. The MAP4Ks come in two general flavors the P21 activated <coughs> kinases and the Citron homology kinases, and MAP4K4 is a member of the latter. And the enabling data that support a uh, drug development program targeting MAP4K4, in other words, solving Koch's postulates as related to cell death, uh, so are summarized in part here. MAP4K4 is activated in human heart tissue in heart failure regardless of cause. Uh, it is activated by defined cardiac death signals both in cell culture and in four mouse models, including myocardial infarction. The gain of function mutation in culture directly drives cardiac muscle cell death through TAC1 and the JNK pathway for loss of the mitochondrial membrane potential. And RNA interference protects rat and human cardiomyocytes in culture. And in the human case, we're using the iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes. I want to emphasize this last point because this is a space that has attracted a lot of activity for clinical trials. But most trials of cardiac protection have failed. And a recurring reason for this, I would argue, is that no trial in this space, indeed no drug, cardiac drug in human history, has entered the clinic on the back of human preclinical data, such as our colleagues in immunology or cancer would consider routine or even mandatory. There hasn't been the tool with which to do this that IPS-derived cardiomyocytes provide at least a partial entry uh, into that space. So our route to drug development is summarized here. Uh, the first portion of this work was done with the uh, Imperial Drug Discovery Facility brought over by Richard Sykes from GSK when he was rector. A primary screen was done against the recombinant human MAP4K4 uh, kinase domain. Uh, the top hits were then subjected to force field modeling to see if compounds that had no obvious similarity to one another in their planar structure might indeed be similar if one understood uh, the charge distribution surrounding them. And indeed, three of our top four hits had a superimposable uh, force field uh, model. And this was used in turn as a computational probe to interrogate a library of nearly four million structures. The top 40 of those, which were immediately available commercially, were then screened. Uh, and we found uh, uh, potency uh, equal to that we found in the primary screen, uh, but marked uh, a marked uplift in selectivity. And it was on the basis of these compounds that we moved forward uh, with Wellcome Trust support into uh, the past two years of structure-driven drug design. In this phase, with our colleagues at uh, the Cambridge medicinal chemistry firm Domainex, has typically involved eight to 10 bespoke compounds per month, design, synthesis, testing, and then another cycle, another iteration, 
guided in the first instance by computational docking models, uh, but in this past year also guided by physical co-crystals of our ligands in the human map for uh, K4 uh, uh, ATP binding site. And, uh, this is shown here for an anonymized version of the ligand, simply confirming that the ligands bind the ATP pocket of map for K4 and induce the so-called folded P-loop conformation uh, this is something that's seen in fewer than 10 human protein kinases and we believe is responsible for our ability to achieve very high selectivity as shown in the next slide. So the evolution and in-cell functions of the inhibitors are summarized in this slide. Uh, here's our starting point. Uh, here's where we are now. A marked increase in potency, not just against recombinant MAP4K4, but also uh, in-cell protection in this case. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a rodent model. Uh, the typical selectivity is shown here, testing the compounds against either 140 human kinases in the Dundee screen or 370 in the reaction biology panel. And you can see here the complete suppression of MAP4K4 activity along with its two closest relatives. Uh, very, very few uh, other potent uh, off-target effects. Uh, none of these is a clinical showstopper. And we see specifically uh, no off-target effects against any protein kinase known to be important for cardiac muscle cell function or cardiotoxicity, such as uh, the tyrosine kinases that are a cause of cardiomyopathy in cancer chemotherapy. Turning to the in-cell function, uh, we show here the rescue of cardiomyocytes, human cardiomyocyte survival, uh, either by our starting compound in, in cyan or the more recent relative uh, in purple, showing the shift to the left. Interestingly, uh, although the uh, stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes are immature in some functional respects relative to native adult human heart muscle, uh, we do believe these assays have predictive power. Indeed, industry has shown that uh, most off-target effects, most off-target toxicities would have been predicted using human stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes had they been available at the time. And the FDA and European regulators are currently in the process of preparing to demand electrophysiology in human stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes as a criterion of safety. But as potential further evidence that the system might have predicted power, we show here, in side-by-side -side comparisons with our compounds, uh, two compounds, metoprolol and exenatide, that failed to consistently confer protection in recent human fa uh, phase two and phase three studies. So we argue that the expedient of testing these in human cardi cardiomyocytes in a dish uh, you might have saved hundreds of millions of pounds, taking just these two as examples. We also have evidence for significant protection of function in the cells, even under sublethal conditions, as shown here for the rescue of mitochondrial function in the so-called seahorse assay, or as uh, in uh, calcium uh, cycling in other experiments. And in the very last data slide, I just want to emphasize we've been able to use the system to progress from human cardiomyocytes in a dish back to whole animal experiments, uh, and the current compounds reduce infarct size by 70% in mice, even given an hour after injury in blinded experiments. We could call it double blinded because the surgeon didn't know and the person analyzing the tissue didn't know. Uh, but we shouldn't call it triple blinded because the mouse didn't know either, but that's uh, another matter. So the take home messages I think are simple. The irreversibility and prevalence of myocardial infarction make heart repair a prime target for regenerative medicine strategies. The most widely tested countermeasure in human trials, bone marrow, is unlikely to be optimal. It might work, but it's unlikely to be optimal. Alternative cell types for implantation include very potent stem cell derivatives, uh, including cardiomyocytes or the precursors, uh, and also adult cardiac stem cells from native myocardium itself. And as I said, seven trials are, going, are, are currently ongoing using variants of the cells I've told you about. And nevertheless, durable engraftment is rare. The observed benefits involve paraffin effects, at least in part, including pro-survival signals and anti-inflammatory ones I haven't had time to discuss today. Besides their mere use as a therapeutic product, human stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes 
are an auspicious platform for target validation and cardiac drug development. So I want to thank the large number of folks at Imperial and Domainex who contributed to this, especially Mikel and Oseda for the stem cell work, and a large team including Katie Chapman for the work on that for paid for. Mike, thanks very much. Questions, David. David Crossman, St. Andrews. Mike, that was masterful. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Um, two, what was the adjective? Masterful. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you being, thought it was something being, worse, did you? <laughs> <laughs> You're hard to please, so I just... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> two, two quick questions. One is, your target selection is obviously an issue. Any chance that going back to that less than one week mouse versus the adult mouse will help you sort of select something that might be a real cracker to take forward. And the second thing is a more sort of clinical question, really, because though, let's face it, there's been an awful lot of energy put into stuff that hasn't come up with very much. And the probability is that heart failure is a very heterogeneous lumpers diagnosis. So if, when you get your molecule going, what would be the group of patients in the phase two trial you'd really like to do it? Would you like to do it at revascularization, established, pre-dilatation, et cetera? So let me answer the second question first because it's, it's quite simple. Although my uh, clinical background and long-term research interest was chronic heart failure, cell death as a contributor to chronic heart failure, industry is evil because they're ignoring the problem. What can we come up with? Uh, as soon as we turned to drug development, we realized they're not evil, they're just pragmatic. Uh, and, and so our, our chosen clinical target as the justification for our Welcome Trust funding, which is now in its uh, third year with another 30 months to go, uh, is acute myocardial infarction, specifically ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, which comprises roughly 30%. And our reason for targeting those is it's a bit more homogeneous than infarcts as a whole, but also it's the more severely affected subset, so the event rate is higher, so the ability to see a benefit uh, in the phase three and potentially phase two trials uh, is enhanced. And whether it would be uh, 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 applicable to other disease groups, uh, including non-ST segment elevation infarction or uh, patients with STEMI not receiving urgent angioplasty in the first six to 12 hours. Uh, that's a matter for other trials. But what I've told you is where we think we can enter the, the, the clinic most easily. Now, if you ask the question, are there likely insights from mining the, uh, the transcriptome or the proteome of the one-day-old mouse, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, some of the countermeasure, potential countermeasures that are already coming out of that analysis are the ones that I alluded to in passing on manipulation of the cardiac uh, cell cycle, uh, ways that can uh, titratably uh, and reversibly stimulate adult cardiomyocytes to proliferate again as a route to uh, cardiac repair. But there are likely to be others out of that, and it's a space that's watched very closely. Mike, I think we're going to have to leave it there because we're out of time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.